And living to an advanced age has its pros and cons, but uh, one of the cons has been having to drive old people's cars like the Toyota Avalon. Are they still for old people? We wanted to find out since the Avalon has been rather dramatically redesigned. So we gathered together six cars that compete in the class with the Avalon, including the new 2014 Chevrolet Impala, the Chrysler 300S, the Dodge Charger SXT, the new all redesigned Hyundai Azera, a new competitor, the 2014 Kia Cadenza, which is based on the Azera, and of course, the redesigned Avalon. We decided to take our six cars for the senior set to Battle Creek, Michigan, home of John Harvey Kellogg, who famously co-invented cornflakes and many techniques for keeping people healthier longer. Now, are any of these six cars worth living for? Let's find out. Neighbors will notice you when you drive home in the 2014 Hyundai Azera. As with a number of recent Hyundais, the car is a looker, with just enough muscular curve and exterior bling to stand apart in the commuting parade. We were certainly impressed with the interior. The dash looks like it's been upholstered with genuine robot skin, zooming you to the future with majestic sweeps of pseudo-metal and faux carbon fiber. It's a layout that doesn't assume you're six feet tall, either. The dash top is low and the gauges and steering column point up from below, so outward visibility is excellent and a strong sense of command develops. Everything about the Azera says yes, that is, until you move the gear selector to D. The problem isn't with the engine or transmission, which works as close partners to create a smooth and eager thrust. The Azera is let down by the steering, which is tuned too heavy and feels leaden at low speeds, always jerking back to center with a snap and not enough body structure is asked to absorb the shock waves generated by too much damping resistance. The result is a continuous crash and reverb over the smallest bumps. Call for the brakes and the answer is weak. Hyundai's have been improving, but we'll keep saying this until it changes. The company can't be taken seriously by our crowd until it fixes its driving experience. Though it finishes near the back, the 2014 Kia Cadenza is the perfect definition of a nice car. Its point lead over the Azera is substantial because Kia chose a better path for its chassis, scrubbing the Hyundai's dynamic mess down to just an annoying clutter. On the Kia, the suspension settings are softer, so every mile in a cadenza isn't a glaring reminder of the needed spot welds and structure bracing that is missing. And Kia opted for higher steering boost, which makes the cadenza more pleasant to wheel around in daily use. True, if you throw it hard at an on-ramp, the wheel feels too light in your palms and you end up sawing the dead rim looking for some sign of tire effort. Yet we prefer the Kia's controls to the Azera's, which is probably why the Cadenza was quickest through the slalom, even beating the Avalon. However, the Cadenza's brakes lack commitment as demonstrated by the longest stopping distance, and hard impacts still rattle the car's relatively loose rafters. Otherwise, as our editor-in-chief Eddie Alterman noted, the reason to choose the Kia over the Hyundai comes down to, quote, whether you like straight lines or curvy lines. The Kia's horizontal styling is almost Volkswagen conservative, not surprising as Kia stole its former chief designer and now company president, Peter Schreyer, from VW Group. The 19-inch fine-spoke wheels fill their body cutouts fully, and the Cadenza, like the lesser Optima it's based on, has a lovely stance. It looks substantial and luxury from every angle. The linearity carries over to the interior. Unlike the supersonic Azera, the Kia is a law firm's conference room inside with orderly straight rows of buttons set in generous slabs of dark gray trim meant to evoke wood. If $41,900 seems expensive for a Kia, know that some of its many optional baubles could be pruned without causing a hardship. Even so, everything you touch feels class, from the half leather wheel to the precision gear selector. As in the Azera, the 3.3-liter V6, our mileage champ at 25 mpg, is still vibration-free and sounding hearty at 6,000 rpm as the transmission waits to execute its next seamless shift. Our takeaway from the new Cadenza is that reasons for not buying a Kia are steadily falling away. The Chrysler 300 is the car that made big sedans cool again, and it continues to look money. A lot of intangibles get invoked when staffers talk about why they like the 300. It's American, it's rear drive, and it sweeps into a parking lot like Al Pacino into a pizzeria with purpose. If you're going to buy a car on principle, this is the one. Befitting its role as a modern day Imperial, the 300 isolates the passengers from bumps with a more compliant chassis than the Chargers. The brakes are the 300's best dynamic attribute. A firm pedal triggers a pit bull's bite on the discs. 
The 300 never feels small, but it can hustle a few corners with decisive grip and accurate, if completely cold, steering. Except for the Art Deco dials and a few small slivers of chrome, the 300's interior is mostly as black as a coal shaft. It's for people who prefer understatement Brooks Brothers style. Well, except for the Beats by Dr. Dre stereo. The most disappointing thing about the 300 is that the rear drive doesn't do much for the handling, and you give up a lot of interior space for it. There's plenty of understeer and body float, and as in the Charger, the 8-speed transmission does its business slowly, even in sport mode as the V6 works hard to keep the heavy mass moving. The S-Badge adds $3,000 in extras, including the, quote, touring suspension, 20-inch wheels, some menacing black chrome exterior treatments, and leather seats with rows of decorative white top stitching. A mere $115 at the bottom line separates this Chrysler from the Dodge, but you don't get as many features in the 300. The Godfather Chrysler is getting old and it will soon be sleeping with the fishes. No doubt whatever replaces it won't have nearly as much personality. Until then, the 300 remains an offer that isn't too difficult to refuse. The Dodge Charger is a car for people who never plan to get old. It's for people planning to die with a Glock in one hand and a jalapeno double cheeseburger in the other. This is old school done as if there never was a new school. Compared to the 300, the Charger is stiffer and sportier, with a little more zest to its directional changes and more crash in its suspension. It feels much too large to throw around, but it does move its tonnage to test max at 4,122 pounds with a controlled aplomb. What the V6 lacks in Hemi Punch, it makes up for in somewhat better fuel economy and reasonable refinement. The 8-speed automatic with its electronic T-bar selector is sophisticated German car technology, but sometimes feels a little slow to deliver the shifts. As with the Chrysler 300, there's not so much payoff for the rear drive. The Charger has a numb rack, and you need the Hemi if you want to roast the inherent understeer into a drift. We expect rear drivers to be automatically and radically better, but the superior steering Avalon proves that there's no immutable rule. You definitely pay for the rear drive and interior space, not necessarily in overall measurements, but in the way the transmission tunnel crowds the gas pedal and in the old-fashioned rear floor hump. The Charger seats were despised by all, mainly for the way the upper backrest falls away, leaving behind some fatiguing pressure points and a vacuum of support. Don't wander into a Dodge showroom expecting the same Epicurean pampering that Kia and the others strive for. The interior is a stark, dark cave of mostly hard plastics, though the giant snowplow blade pressed into the dash's decoration livens things up. You'll always be young in the Charger, which is great as long as you don't mind putting up with some inconveniences that didn't bother you when you were young. GM almost hits the big car bullseye with the new 2014 Chevy Impala. Sure, there are things we would change, such as the interior, which, despite the 1001 ideas thrown at the dash, still manages to seem less deluxe. Otherwise, the Chevy puts the pickle in the barrel with a spacious car that steams along quietly and smoothly, and it looks like a four-door Camaro. GM assumes you want big iron because you need space. The Impala's cathedral-sized trunk is the largest at 19 cubic feet, and it's accessed through a clamshell lid that looks like it'll take a pair of skis sideways. The front seats have the most cubic feet in the test, and the folding rear seats don't pinch either, offering ample head and knee clearance. The 3.6-liter V6 purrs quietly, and it hits the high notes with a minimum of buzz, making for the quickest acceleration times, albeit in a field where the 60mph sprint times are separated by only half a second. The Impala's pavement stickiness is solid, making for fast passage through corners, and compared to the Korean twins, the Impala feels as solid as a Mercedes S-Class. The body soaks up the pavement blows better than any car in this test, offering the best ride. But the Impala is no floater. It leans and pitches no more than necessary and feels tied down in fast twisties. Two things we'd ask for are more steering feedback and better brake feel. The pedal pushes through a lot of sponge before finally finding brakes to engage. In many ways, the Impala strikes a better ride and handling balance than the Avalon, which has a rigid harshness to its ride. Do buyers in this class really want a stiff suspension? GM doesn't think so, and neither do we. Toyota has been in this game for a while, and it's learned a few things, like how to make a car with copious interior space, a rigid structure, and decent steering. These necessary elements all come together in the Avalon, which isn't completely ugly either, finally. 
The Avalon is sprung too stiffly for being the old guy's Toyota, but its suspension is more sophisticated than that of the Korean twins. It takes the rough stuff with far less body shutter, dampening out the audible tire slap to distant wumps. The alert steering is weighted just right between the too soft Kia and the too heavy Azera, with a more natural rise and effort as you bend the Avalon around a curve. The test Featherlight at 3,521 pounds is also the quickest car, posting the best acceleration numbers and earning strong slalom and skid pad slips. The Avalon's dash looks like an architectural student's final project. Overlapping surfaces create a deep three-dimensionality that is both fascinating and modern, though the chrome wings around the gauges remind us of horned rim glasses. The score is seesaw through this test. The Avalon joins the other Far Easterners by earning high marks in the static categories of design and fit and finish, while the Detroiters do better in the dynamic categories. However, the Avalon is a shapely, gifted consensus builder, doing as good or better in all the measures, and it best fulfills our prescription for high quality and low stress in a near luxury sedan.